Last Friday, Dyn, a provider of DNS for some large companies like Twitter, suffered a major outage as the result of a denial of service attack. This event uh, made the news big time, so in case you have to brief your boss or your team about uh, this event, we put together these slides to help you be prepared for such a briefing. Now, you may use these slides however you see fit, you may modify them, you don't have to use all of the slides, or you may add your own. The only thing we ask for is that you do give us some credit if you end up using any of these slides. So first of all, what is DNS? Uh, DNS is often described as the phone book for the internet. It translates human readable host names into IP addresses. It's not just used for the web, it's also used, for example, for email. If you're sending an email to someone, then DNS is used to figure out which mail server is responsible for receiving email for a particular domain. If you do own a domain, then you have to make sure that you or someone else is running an authoritative name server that resolves host names and other records related to that domain. You may run your own DNS, uh, nothing really terribly wrong with that, but the problem is uh, DNS isn't quite easy to run correctly, so a lot of companies choose to outsource DNS and Dyn is one company among many that will do that for you. Of course, the advantage you get here is that they have a large infrastructure that will help you provide reliable and also low latency DNS for your customers. So who is this company called Dyn? Well, uh, before Friday, not too many people knew that the company even existed. It made its name originally providing dynamic DNS service for mostly home users and small businesses that do not have a static IP address. So if you have, for example, a DSL modem and uh, your IP address changes every few days and you would like to run a web server on that DSL modem, then you can sign up with Dyne and uh, they will then set up DNS so it will follow your IP address. Over the years, uh, Dyne also added enterprise services to their portfolio. They have a very large, uh, very geographically diverse set of name servers that makes them well suited to provide very fast, very reliable DNS for uh, large companies. And that's really what we saw on Friday being hit, that enterprise part uh, of Dyne that does supply DNS for domains like Twitter.com and Netflix.com. Dyne isn't the only provider of services like this. Amazon, for example, has its Route 53 service. We also have uh, offerings like Cloudflare and the like that also offer a DNS service, sometimes uh, also with sort of more a focus on weathering a denial of service attacks. So what went wrong on Friday if Dyn is such a big company that has uh, servers uh, located worldwide? Well, the problem was really the scale of the denial of service attack. The exact numbers, I think, are still a little bit open to debate, but the botnet that attacked Dyn has anywhere between 500,000 and 10 million hosts that did participate in the attack and essentially they just flooded Dyn with uh, DNS queries. So this made it very difficult for Dyn to defend itself because they cannot block DNS queries. They, that's their business. So as a result, uh, they experienced uh, slow responses and outages, at least in part of their network. It looks like in particular servers on the East Coast of the US were hit particularly bad by this attack. West Coast, not so much, but also experienced some outages. 
other parts of the world appear to be less impacted by this attack. So the big question, of course, that always comes up after an attack like this, who did it and you know, why was it done? Because that in part also affects how likely you're going to be hit by this attack. And that's really the scary part here. We have no idea who is behind this attack. We know the botnet being used in this attack was the Mirai botnet. This botnet uh, mostly consists of security cameras and the like. It's actually not very sophisticated in the way it was built. Uh, it just relies on devices that have uh, fixed passwords uh, to essentially you know, exploit them and install itself on these devices. But it is very large and has led to some record-breaking denial of service attacks in the past. So usually these denial of service attacks are done to silence uh, websites that are uh, politically controversial. We also have uh, seen denial of service attacks being used for ransom, where you sort of hold a particular company for ransom. But uh, in this particular case, nobody came forward to state why this particular target was selected. It's not even clear if Dyne was the actual target or if one of Dyne's customers was the target and it just happened to affect the Dyne infrastructure overall because, well, they happened to host DNS for the target domain. And then, of course, uh, the question, will it affect you? Uh, can you predict whether or not an attack like this uh, will affect you? Well, if you're hosting with a provider like Dyn, then of course, there's always a chance that you're sort of getting caught up in an attack that's actually targeting someone else that happens to use the same service. But uh, given that we don't really know the motive behind the attack at this point, more or less anybody uh, could be the next target. The Mirai botnet behind it is still effective. It's still uh, there. Uh, it looks actually like it's less of an issue that uh, Dyn defended against this attack. It's more that the Mirai botnet decided to no longer attack Dyn. So um, the attack against Dyn could flare up again at any point in time. Of course, by now Dyn may have had some time to actually put some better defenses in place, but against a denial of service attack like this, it's almost impossible to sort of find a perfect defense. You will almost always end up with at least a temporary outage. And then uh, this particular botnet has uh, conducted other denial of service attacks in the past. For example, against uh, Brian Krebs's blog, they just used uh, HTTP requests. Uh, against Dyn, they used uh, DNS uh, queries. So it really depends on the target and they have a wide range of possible denial of service attacks uh, that they could potentially conduct using uh, this botnet. Now, there are a couple things that you can do uh, to minimize the risk of being caught up in a denial of service attack like this. Overall, the bad news here is it almost always involves spending money. In the end, you sort of have to buy your way out of these denial of service attacks by signing up for sufficiently large anti-denial of service attack providers. So. For example, with DNS, uh, instead of just relying on one DNS provider like Dyn, uh, you could sign up with multiple DNS providers. Of course, you will have to pay all of them. And in addition, you have to manage all of these uh, providers. Each one of them has a different method, a different API in how you, for example, update records. There are a couple tools available that sort of allow you to manages a little bit easier, essentially translators, where you sort of make one change and then the tool pushes it out to the different uh, providers. But overall, of course, uh, there's more overhead involved in managing the relationship with all of these uh, DNS uh, providers that you may have uh, to sign up for. Another option, of course, is that you keep at least some DNS service 
in-house. That way, if it's the service that's being attacked and not your company, then you may have a fallback here, but you just uh, use your own DNS servers instead of uh, the provider's DNS servers. It may also retain then some limited availability to your own users in your company since they will use your DNS server instead of uh, the global DNS servers provided by the DNS provider. Another trick that you can play is you can increase the time to live of your DNS records. This determines how long your DNS answers are cached for. And of course, if let's say you put a time to live in there for, um, for an hour, then if someone just downloaded or requested uh, the DNS record, now the denial of service attack starts, well, they'll be good for the next hour. But of course, if you make that time too large, then you lose some of the agility that you may need to defend yourself against other denial of service attacks. So this is a difficult balance here uh, that uh, you have to figure out uh, for your own network. So what should you actually do in response? Well, I, I would definitely review your DNS infrastructure. Which services are you using? Are you running it in-house? What kind of load are you able to, uh, to absorb? What are your contractual relationships with your DNS uh, service, with your anti-DNL of service providers? Will they be able to deal with an attack like the one against Dyne? You should definitely look into using multiple uh, DNS uh, providers. And uh, then it's also very important with denial of service attacks that you're able to monitor, not just that you are under an attack. That's usually pretty easy. You, know, you, you will have people complain, they can get to your site, but the difficult part can be to characterize denial of service attack, to exactly know what is hitting you, because you will need to know that to then coordinate uh, with your anti-denial of service providers. So you can tell them what traffic uh, to fill throughout and how to mitigate the attack. Now, then of course, the real problem here in some ways is this Mirai botnet. So what can be done against that? Well, first of all, you do not want to be part of the problem. So you should make sure that you don't have any compromised devices in your network. You would see a lot of outbound telnet traffic from these devices. And in general, of course, uh, you should be careful about exposing any devices like that uh, to the internet. Particular port 23 should, if possible, be blocked at your parameter to not allow any inbound or outbound uh, telnet traffic. Now, on a global scale, ISPs are working to disrupt uh, the command control uh, capability of the Mirai botnet. This will not clean up affected machines, but it will prevent uh, the owner of the botnet to send additional commands uh, to these bots and essentially to launch any new denial of service attacks. It's a bit hard to tell uh, how well this is going, but uh, overall, but I have seen a lot of large ISPs in the US like Comcast and uh, for example, uh, Google with their public DNS server, uh, they will no longer resolve uh, the domain names that are being used uh, by this uh, botnet. But uh, the DVRs and the cameras and all of these devices, they will remain vulnerable. So it's probably just a matter of time for someone else uh, to take them over. So in conclusion, uh, you can't really defend, at least not perfectly, against these large uh, denial of service attacks. The only chance you have is if you get help from others, like I said, you have to buy your way out of them by signing up uh, for sufficient anti-denial of service services, test them, make them sure they work as advertised, learn how to fail over. Because once you are under a denial of service attack, then of course things have to happen rather quickly and you want to have a set playbook at that point that you follow. And you need to be able to characterize these denial of service attacks quickly to figure out um, What's the what's the nature really? What you need to change uh, to fight the attack? And as far as these Internet of Think type devices are concerned, 
be careful, assume they're vulnerable. Right now, we are seeing botnets like Mirai going after very simple vulnerabilities, like Telnet with a well-known password that cannot be changed. In the future, I expect these attacks to move on to web application vulnerabilities and such that we also typically find in these type of devices. So this is really just the beginning of what we should expect in the next few years. Well, that's it uh, for now. I appreciate any feedback. We may make some updates uh, to this presentation based on that uh, feedback. So uh, please let me know if I should change, modify, add, or remove anything. Thanks.